Sustainability will be a continual concern for the next 30 to 50 years. Besides sustainability challenge, what are the opportunities? The next session, we will have entrepreneurs and investors share with us opportunities in ASEAN. Let's welcome moderator Li Xingxing, his managing director and a senior China analyst from Observatory Group, also a Caixin colonist. Zhong Li Xingxing are Ning Hai, co-president of MasterCard Asia Pacific. Tan Qinghui, CEO Asia Pacific, Trafigra and the chairman of Estratadex Services. Jaka Prescha, partner of a private equity in Southeast Asia from KKR. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Caixin Summit panel from China to ASEAN, uh, Megatrends for Global Investors. Uh, uh, the goal of the next 50 minutes is to examine the business and uh, investment opportunities uh, between China and ASEAN in the coming years. China is the second largest economy in the world and it keeps moving up global value chains, whereas um, ASEAN is a rising economic powerhouse with growing manufacturing base and income level and the technology sophistication. Where are the opportunities for global investors in the region? How should they set out their strategies? And what can policymakers do to help investors and the businesses navigate through these mega trends? To answer these questions, today we have a fabulous panel with us, and I call it as an all-star team. Uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, from my near end to the far end, we have um, first Mr. Lin Hai, co-president of MasterCard Asia Pacific. In this, in this capacity, uh, Mr. Lin Hai also oversees all the company's activities in the region. Uh, he also is a member of MasterCard's management committee. Uh, Mr. Lin is one of the most successful uh, overseas Chinese professionals working for multinational companies. Um, Mr. Tang Jin Tang Jin, Tang Jin Hui, CEO Asia Pacific of um, uh, Trafigura, uh, one of the world's largest commodity trading company. He's also chairman of um, SG Tradex and Services, um, Singapore Trade Data Exchange. Uh, Mr. Tang is also a member of um, several advisory teams and uh, advisory panels of Singaporean government. And he also an uh, adjunct professor at um, Nanyang Technological University. Uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University and also Yale University. So his career is a combination of successful experience in business, government, and academia. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Jackan Presidia, partner of KKR, uh, a global investment company that manages multiple uh, alternative asset classes. In his role, uh, Jackan is, a leading, is, a, is leading KKR's private equity team in South Asia. He's also an expert of um, uh, credit and uh, special situation investment. At KKR, Jack has closed uh, several high-profile deals, and he's indeed a star private equity investor. Uh, so please join me to welcome these um, uh, distinguished panel speakers. And I, I really appreciate you all for being here. So let me start with um, uh, some warming up questions. Uh, first one, let's go to uh, Mr. Lin Hai. Um, everyone knows MasterCard. Uh, as a global pioneer in payment innovation and technology for decades, and MasterCard keeps its finger on the pulse and of and the key change of the societies, ranging from uh, demographic to consumption habit. Can you give us a quick glimpse of change of consumers uh, in the fast-changing Asian markets? Please. Th thank you so much, Xingxing, and thank you, uh, Cai Xing, for inviting me. Um, let me say that I actually see a lot more commonalities across the region. So one of the trends you're probably all aware of is the, this acceleration of digitization. It, it was already happening pre-COVID, but it's now it's being accelerated. And of course, close to me and in my life, my parents are in their 80s. They have to use now WeChat to order things and get delivery, and they do more online stuff, which really to me is amazing because you have to. Um, and with this acceleration of digitization, what we see is 
a, a real shift from sort of the physical commerce to e-commerce. Traditionally, if you look at the developed world, e-commerce is roughly about 15%, 10 to 15% of the total retail spend, uh, depending where you are in the developed world. And if you're looking at the developing countries in Asia Pacific, that, that percentage is probably half of the 10 to 15%. But we're seeing a significant shift. Now the bifurcation here again is between the developed world and the developing world is in a developed country, you see a much bigger surge at the beginning of the pandemic. And now as countries revert back to normal because they decide to live with COVID, vaccination rates are improving, uh, borders are opening, we are seeing some reversion back to sort of the pre-pandemic level. And in the developing world, it's actually different. It's a much slower take up. And I see a lot more of the online behaviors, behaviors sticking. Um, so overall, if you take a look at the, the data, I think roughly 20 to 30% of the shift from offline to online is gonna stay, it's gonna stick. Um, at, a, at a global level. The second thing I want to quickly mention is this, this adoption of technology and adoption of innovation. Again, the time frame is shortening. It's just becoming much faster. Again, to use an example that's close to me, I started working on contactless payments, NFC, in the US in 2004. It took more than 10 years, right? Even Singapore, the UK is about 10 years time frame. The US is still not there entirely yet, right? But now if you look at QR adoption in China, for example, it's less than five years, it's everywhere. So I think this technology adoption, you're gonna see this tremendous shortening of the time frame. And today, for instance, if you think about blockchain, crypto, you think about AI, and now we're talking about metaverse, right? Again, consumers are getting much used to these new concepts and much more willing to try them and, uh, and actually adopt them. So that's the other phenomenon, I would say. The last thing I want to quickly mention is, with everything get, getting more digitized, you see an interesting phenomen, phenomenon among consumers. That is, they want both data privacy and convenience or data transparency. They don't want to make a trade-off, i.e., I want to make my data available when it's necessary, but I expect the providers to protect my privacy. If you think about the payment space, as we do payments electronically, you're leaving a digital footprint, right? I, as a consumer, for instance, I expect MasterCard to protect my privacy. I don't want anybody to get hold of my credentials that's unauthorized, and I expect the company to safeguard that. So we cannot just do this with yesterday's technology. We have to use new innovation. And that's why things like decentralized, distributed storage of data, this is where things like tokenization, right? It's a way to anonymize your real credential. One time use only credential for purchases, but if somebody get hold of it, they can't really use it, right? Those are the real ways to provide consumers with both ease, convenience, but also safety, security, and privacy. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Ling Hai. Uh, Trafficura is one of the uh, world's leading uh, independent commodity trading house. And we know that it's the world's largest private metal traders and the second largest oil trader. Uh, what's your take in cross-border trade and uh, what, what did you do to respond to the changing trade landscape? Mr. Tang, if you may please. Thank you. Uh, Okay, thank you. So Trafigura actually uh, moved our HQ uh, from Europe to Singapore six years ago. This is when I joined. And I think we're in the right place, right time. Over the last six years, we have more than doubled our revenue, uh, and mostly from Asia. So I think to your point, I think it has moved east. Uh, the financing has moved east. Well, but it's easy to just to move the structure. Well, but at the end of the day, we talk about so much today, up to today, about strategy. Right, about what we need to do, about renewable, about uh, digitization. Again, speaker of the speaker, but I was thinking sitting down there uh, just now earlier, right, um, what really matters is not the strategy, right, is more the execution. And what could make a difference in the execution is the people. Right? So at least if I look back, uh, the last six years for Trafigura, we have localized every single offices in APEC. 
uh, 20 officers. Well, so what I meant by that is a Vietnamese run a Vietnam office, an Indonesian run an Indonesian office. Right? And this also helped to deepen the ties right, in the local setting. Right? Because we talk about globalization, but globalization means different things to different community. So the key here, the better word is connectivity, right? emotional connectivity. How do we do business in the trusted system? And that is something that uh, my role will, will help me. Over the years, I learned a lot. Uh, before this, I was with Jaya. I was in private equity, and we compete on investing money. But today, I think it's slightly different. It's back to execution. So I think the world from here to the future, and for the sake of our children, is how we're going to execute collectively. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, as all we know, KKR uh, has been a prolific investor in Asia Pacific uh, since it entered the region uh, 16 years ago. Uh, it has a comprehensive approach in, uh, in private equity, infrastructure, real estate, and, and credit. Uh, most recently, KKR has uh, closed a uh, 15 billion uh, fund. It's, a, it's a re really a record number for its East Asia uh, focused on private equity fund. Uh, from the pers perspective of a global investor and as a manager, uh, what long-term growth drivers do you see in this region? Uh, what's the uh, uniqueness of this market? And Thank you, Susan. Um, you use a lot of kind words for us, so really appreciate that. Um, I think the story about Asia, since I at least started my career 20 years ago, has always been about you know, very favorable demographics as well as strong macroeconomic growth, right? Uh, I think you know, the Western world looking at that as being something that they're lacking, right? Now, the things that people underappreciate a lot of time is that you know, Asia is very different than uh, US and, and, and Europe. Asia is a collection of countries, right? So every country in Asia provide different type of opportunities, even though the underlying is the same. So the way we look at this is that um, if, we, if, we, if we talk about how we started in Asia with private equity business in 2005, our focus has always been, you know, investing with uh, uh, good companies and help them to take them to the next level. But I think, you know, with the different developments in, uh, in different countries, I think the word global investment firm is somehow a little bit more diluted, per se. I think the key to success in investing in many countries in Asia um, is being local. So we always strive to be, you know, I don't know what's the right word, whether or not the most global local firm or the most local global firm. Right, so we leverage of all our global capabilities, as including, you know, operational excellence and, and and good practices that we've learned from more developed market, but also being local and try to understand the markets, try to understand who to partner with, try to understand what is the uh, uh, the best, you know, investment proposition for each of the countries, and that translate into you know in in, in developed markets more on controlling type of deals where we back national champions to be a global player, say for instance, or in Southeast Asia and in South Asia market, uh, we tend to be very flexible in terms of our approach. If control is not available, we tend to be, you know, taking the, uh, not the back seat, but probably on the, you know, on, on, on the next seat to the driver to help, you know, companies to uh, navigate the things that, you know, Jin, we talk about globalization and so on and so forth, right? So I think to answer your questions again, it's a very attractive market, right? But we look at it opportunity differently. And hence, you know, in Asia alone, we have nine offices in comparison to 21 offices that we have globally. So we have a lot of local people. And if you go to China, you'll be dealing with our Chinese colleagues that, you know, speaking fluent languages. I speak like a seven years old, you know, Chinese. In China, they call me Indonesian. In Indonesia, they call me Chinese. But, you know, the dynamic of being local and try to be, you know, thinking on the same pace and the same way of looking at it with, with, with people, the, the business people is actually important for us. So that is key strategy for us. Okay, great, great. So thank you so much for your answer uh, for the first round of warming up questions. So let's get into our point and the mega trends in, uh, in the region. Uh, we are still in the middle of this pandemic. Um, the past two years of um, COVID have been a uh, painful experience for many people uh, in the region. 
And after this pandemic peaked, and, uh, the, the uneven and the unbalanced recovery also has caused some problems in, in Asia. So uh, what challenge and opportunities has the pandemic created for investors, for your business? Are there any upsides of this pandemic experience since every cloud has a silver lining? So let me start the, this question with uh, Qinghui, please. Because I know you're, you are uh, a member of the uh, advisory uh, board of this so-called e uh, EST, the e Emerging St Strategic Task Force. It's a government task force to map out the strategy of Singapore in the post-pandemic world. So please. Thank you. Uh, so earlier I was with my boss, uh, DPM Hing. He's my chairman for the EST task force. Uh, so I have a chance also to debrief him uh, some of the things that we are progressing. Um, I think for the Singapore government, uh, when we got the uh, EST together, it was highly opportunistic. It was a white piece of paper. And we asked ourselves, uh, what can we do for our little red dot with the pandemic? What could change? Um, and in the end, uh, two big projects came out of it. One is SG Trade Dex, uh, which is the trading uh, exchange, uh, digital exchange for Singapore and for the world. The other is the carbon exchange. Right? So the SG Trade Dex, I'm the chair, and carbon exchange, I'm on the board. Right? So these are the two big ideas that we'll try to bring it forward. But Singapore is a small island. right? Uh, the real giants are China and USA. So like what uh, Li Xing just now, when you, you asked the DPM Hing on the stage, well, we need to be relevant. So the key here is how do we execute the strategy to make ourselves relevant? Right? Uh, so this is the dynamics that we are in today. Again, it boils down to execution, and again, it boils down to what kind of people we hire at the individual level to execute. I, I think that is the, sometimes a question that most people just overlook. But they think the system, the structure will set up. Right? But actually, uh, away from that macro trend, uh, now I think this is a lot more difficult. right? Uh, because I put myself again in Jaya Shu, I look as an investor, you have many other things to worry. Right? Not, last time is quite straightforward. Right? It's a US-led policy. Right? Uh, now it's very different. It's very dynamic. Right? There are many, many different undercurrent what that you need to work out through. Right? So the execution has to be a lot more sharper. The mistakes and the buffer are no longer as such. Right? So, so, and the tolerance level are very low. Right? So I, I'm glad I'm no longer an institutional investor like you. Uh, when you manage your own money or your company's money, you have a more perpetual long-term view, and that will help. Time will help. Right? So, so I think the fund investor, which are essential in this dynamics uh, have a very difficult job because their investors are a lot more short term. Right? So I, I, I think this, this, this is going to change a lot of uh, issues that on hand. Yeah. Great, great. Since uh, Jinghu mentioned that execution is the key, let's pass this question to you, Jaka. You're the executor of the deals. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think first of all, the pandemic has been very difficult for everyone. That's, that's one thing. There's a lot of uh, initiatives that, you know, when it started off, focusing really about how we can make the impact in the, in the communities, right? So we're talking about, you know, out of the 450 billion asset under management that we have, we are employing close to a million employees around the world. There is one, right? And, uh, you know, my bosses always say, remember who your real bosses are. And for us, our, you know, the, the teachers, the, the, the firefighters, the, uh, the pensioners in all of the world. So, so what we do really need to start thinking about the community, right? So we started off with, you know, the, the, the small little things as, you know, we have a relief fund to help people. You know, we, we set aside like $15 million to help up, you know, whatever they can help up across, across, across the uh, difficult time on this one, right? But I think if, if you talk about, you know, what pandemic means from investing, um, purely from the commercial uh, perspective, it's actually a wake-up call, right? So, you know, given our investment targets, they tend to be more established company, they tend to be pampered by, you know, market positioning and so on and so forth, right? So, you know, implementing changes has been not straightforward, right? People used to do things the way they did it, right? Imagine you're talking with, you know, 80 years old billionaire that built the business 50 years ago and say, you know, it's 
it's been very easy for us to do it to get it from that point to this point. Why do I have to change? Right? So, you know, but, you know, what changes? We just need to look at the way we, we live our life, right? You know, we, we, we consume the food differently. We build, people talk about, you know, just now uh, uh, Impossible Burger and all so, so on and so forth, right? The way we do your business, the way your consumer wants to consume the way they do it, and, you know, consumption upgrade, uh, food safety, and so on and so forth, is getting more and more relevant. And the old way may not be the right way nowadays, right? So the opportunity to actually go down, and the first thing that we did when the pandemic hits was to reach out to our portfolio companies and see whether or not there are things that we really need to, uh, uh, to, to, to focus on and to make sure that we have safety nets for the operations and so on and so forth, including you know, the safety of our people and employees and, 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 and their families as well, and really take it from there and start thinking about how to do it the right way or the different way, right? People talk about, you know, some, some famous guy said, well, not some famous, a very famous guy said, you know, if you hate change, you okay. will hate obsolete more, right? So the obsolescence is getting, the obsolescence cycle is getting shorter and shorter. Yeah. I think if you want to look at the silver lining of the pandemic, is things going to change, right? Not that the things that we do today is going to be the same way going forward. The things that introduced in pandemic may not stay either. Right, so those are the way that we think we encourage our portfolio companies to to uh, to, to to dig deeper and 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 probably end up with different playbook going forward. Great, great, thank you so much. So uh, uh, I think Lin Hai, you have already mentioned some of these trends and uh, opportunities and, uh, arising from the pandemic, such as in digitization, and I think it's a very important for uh, a consumer oriented and company like in MasterCard. Can, can you elaborate on that part? Sure, but I, I just want to directly address your question in terms of sort of you, you asked, is there any upside? I think the real upside of the pandemic is the fact that it exposed the vulnerabilities of our society, right? The, the vulnerability of humanity against this tiny little invisible <laughs> virus called COVID-19. The fact that we as societies are still very divided. I mean, even our views towards vaccinations uh, are very different, right? Yes. So, but I want to actually take a slightly different angle that's related to digitization yeah. and, and the pandemic. That is, I actually think one of the things that the pandemic exposed is that there's, there's still so many people in, in, this, uh, in, in this part of the world, but also overall globally, that are financially excluded. So the bifurcation that's revealed by the pandemic is huge. Let me explain to you what I mean. You think about big businesses versus small businesses, right? If big, big businesses usually are digitized, they have lots of data, they got the capital, so most of them can get through this. But if you're a small mom and pop store, you're a small restaurant, or you happen to be in a hospitality business, right? And, and by the way, people who work in the hospitality business are usually the low skilled, low income workers, and who can afford to lose their jobs, they lose their jobs and the small businesses who cannot go digital, who cannot take orders online, who, you, you, if you're a bakery, for example, right? You can take orders online, you cannot do delivery, you have to sh but you have to shut your physical store. You go out of business, right? And, and if you're a small business, how do you compete when you don't have the insights? You don't have the data and the insights, right? So this digital divide, this data divide, insights divide, but more importantly, this financial exclusion that, that's faced by many of the small businesses has become a very, very important, prominent issue. I also want to emphasize that when we think about financial inclusion, most of the people think about, oh, allow small businesses to have bank accounts. That's not it. In fact, the key, the, the key to the kingdom in financial inclusion is access to capital, access to credit, right? If I'm a small, if, let's say I'm a gig worker, I lose my job in the pandemic, now I want to try something new, I want to start a business and I have no credit, I have no capital, I cannot do that. So this is one thing MasterCard is looking at, right? We want to leverage our payment platform, but also the data we have, transactional data we have, to help SMEs get credit, get access to credit, right? Because if I'm a lender, what do I worry most about a small business? The ability to pay me back, right? 
But if I have data on their behaviors in terms of ordering inventory, paying their supplies, making sales, right? So you understand their income, they under, you, you understand the cash inflow and outflow, that will help any lender make a better credit decision. So that is one thing I think we're very focused and it's completely a problem that's being exacerbated by the pandemic. And, and this whole thing about financial inclusion, reduce the digital divide, reduce the data divide, is, is a very worthy effort, I think, for all of us in the ecosystem to work together on. Great, so in the first mega trend, we have already covered so many different aspects. And so let's shift to another very different topic, which is in, uh, climate change and the ESG. Um, we have seen in recent years and, uh, globally uh, here uh, in Asia, both in China and ASEAN countries, and uh, this big shift in, uh, from the focus on speed of growth into quality of growth. And, in particular on addressing the issues such as climate change and the sustainability. And today the timing is, in, uh, is, in, is great because of the last day of the COP26 and this, COP, this meeting in uh, Glasgow. Uh, so my question uh, goes to uh, Jacka. How do you think about uh, integrating the good environment and social and uh, governance practices into the way you manage, manage your business? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a... a a big and important topics nowadays. And I think, you know, all the stakeholders are aligned that this is something that we need to work on. Uh, you know, every time you talk about, you know, our fundraising exercise as well, you know, recently during the pandemic, or our LPs asking how we, we handle that, right? And I think, you know, the, the things that's slightly different now than 10 years ago is about what do you do actually about it, right? I think, I think in the past, you know, we always talk about don't invest in sensitive industry. As simple as that, and you can say we are, you know, a green company if you don't invest in, 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 in bad industries, right? Uh, I don't think that's enough, right? So the way we look at it is that it's not a zero-sum game, right? It's not about not doing the bad things and not supporting those industries, but what can we do to influence those and as well as, you know, enlarging the pies by being proactively created you know, climate change and financial inclusions and diversities and, and so on and so forth positively, right? So, you know, we, we do invest in directly in the space that, that create value. Say, for instance, we invested in solar and wind panels in, uh, in, in, in India, say, for instance. Uh, but we also invest in, in, in the Philippines, in the, in the conventional energy generations, right? If we can convince ourselves that we can somehow influence our companies to have a clearer path. And I think the benefit of being a global investor is we have a lot of knowledge and know-hows. And, 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 and the, the lesson learned that we have from different parts of the world that has different cycle and stages already and try to adapt that and, and really you know, push down, not, not so much push down, but encourage our portfolio company, either the company that we control or we're partnering with, to actually be positive about it, right? Um, but it's not, again, uh, not only just directly, but it's also indirectly. Uh, co consumer companies, say, for instance, which is you know, a big topic in investing in, Sou in Southeast Asia, consumption story, right? Um, supply chains management is a big issue. Yeah, we, for instance, we invested in a biscuit company in Australia that sources all their raw material and, and CPOs from, from Southeast Asia. We want to make sure that the, uh, the supply chain management is in place where we only source for sustainable you know, sources on this one. Or on a company that sometimes is not very obvious, like you know, we invested in uh, uh, auto parts companies in Japan, uh, Merrillis, or which people are going to say, hey, you know what, that is a bad you know, uh, uh, carbon um, footprint. But we say, you know what, since we, since we invest this, I think today we're proud to say that 90% of their waste are either recycled or reused already. So implementing the mindset of not only avoiding the issue, but really, and this is part of the diligence that we do before we invest, a lot of dating period that we spend is about not just taking the box, but what can we do on the aspect of the business that we can improve? I think that's, that's probably you know, the better way rather than just avoiding. Great. Um, I know there's a widespread you know, concern in the market that, in, um, at least in the early stage of the green transition, 
um, you know, this ESG issue will increase the cost uh, for investment and uh, for business. And, um, maybe this is related to another major issue we're facing today, which is inflation. Uh, so um, the inflation, especially commodity prices, uh, continue to rise across the board. Uh, energy shortage is emerging in many countries. Um, so if the global central bankers, and I think many uh, of our panelists or speakers already have touched upon this topic, and if those uh, global central bankers are wrong, and the ongoing inflation is not transitory, how should the investors and the businesses be prepared for the new age of global uh, inflation? Is that going to change the, the household consumption pattern as well? So let me uh, uh, throw this question to uh, Jinghui first. If you look at the China factory prices, it's up 13.5%, one of the highest ever, right? but there's also a difference between the China CPI. Then if you turn to the US CPI number, well, which is the 30 years high at 6 over percent, you may think that uh, 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 the world has not caught up, right? but, uh, but the world has already given a lot of signal as early as six months ago that inflation or inflationary expectations are, is going to come in. I think uh, I look at it more at a practical basis than most of the economists. It's actually not inflation itself, but it's the inflationary expectation right, that is going to change. Well, as simple as I met my mother on Sunday, she told me that everything in the market has gone up in Singapore. So she has to buy now today, right? talking about basic things. So this is the one that drives uh, the real world. That's how I see it. Right? We can base on the numbers. Right? Uh, one of the key reasons why six months ago you could highlight uh, uh, that uh, it is coming to heat is because of the demand of big countries like China, for example, who demanded that at least 15% of the energy mix must be from hydro. And six months ago, the data really show hydro is not unable to meet that need. So what will a government actually do? Right? If you don't have enough storage, you will start to buy quietly in the market, right? buy the fossil fuel. And that's what has been happening. Right? And uh, when the two months ago when I was, one month ago when I was in UK, when they ran out of gas, right? uh, and gas storage, right? actually many of the government, if they have a, better uh, uh, feedback loop, they will have identified that the problem is actually there. Right? Uh, instead of just keep thinking about structure, the structure will solve the problem. Uh, maybe a better feedback mechanism uh, where the people on the ground can be all on, more honest in giving the feedback will help to solve the problem. Right? It's like uh, what Ling Hai said about the pandemic. Who the hell will know uh, for sure uh, uh, what this pandemic will come, right? Nobody will know, right? Uh, and, but many countries have been trying to do an end-to-end -end solution, as though we know everything. Uh, I think we, we collectively, as humans, we need to be a little bit more humble that we don't know everything, right? So what we can do is to execute as best as we can and then provide buffer right, to, meet that, to meet that need. So that is how we have been running our business. Right, in traffic rural, why right? we assume we do not know everything, at least within my small circle of influence, we try to build buffer. Uh, and one of the buffer is to choose the right person for the right job at the right time, right? Uh, and things may change, then you change again. Right? So this is how I, I look at it. Right? Uh, uh, and unfortunately, in this real world, I think the, the bureaucracy, who are very over-educated, may think that they have a solution when, the, when it is clear from this pandemic, from this digitization, and, and from this renewable saga where China, India, or many, uh, UK, and many countries in Europe, I think missed the mark. I think it's a, it's a good wake up call, like what Jaya say, and for all of us, that we need to be a bit humble. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let me ask you the same question to Lin Hai. Uh, probably you have a lot of insights about the consum consumer behavior. Uh, yeah. So yes, MasterCard has this economic institute, so we do look at the data, we do some analysis. So let, let me first by, uh, start by saying, we do see inflation, by the way, okay? The question becomes transitory versus permanent. And, and even when we say transitory, like is one year transitory or three years transitory, how permanent is permanent? 
So I will tell you, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant right now to say how much longer will this continue. Let me explain to you what we see. Most of the inflation right now is caused by the supply side. It's the supply chain disruption. So in general, when it's supply side induced inflation, it tends to be transitory because you believe the market will adjust, right? And this is also where when central banks shouldn't be raising rates because when you want to encourage investments and business expansion, you raise rate, that will do the opposite. And, and so that's why the Federal Reserve is actually doing the right thing by withdrawing liquidity, but not necessarily increasing uh, the cost of borrowing, i.e. interest rate. But I completely with the view uh, Mr. Tan just shared, that is, the bigger problem is the inflationary expectation because that's what drives, that usually, especially on the wage side, wage inflation, that the expectation of inflation will drive wage inflation itself. I.e., if I'm a worker, I expect things to be more expensive, I'm going to negotiate a higher salary, and the mere fact that I'm negotiating a higher salary, I'm creating a higher cost of production, which then companies have to pass on to the, the, the consumers, right? So I think in, in the world, you start to see a lot of central banks start to raise rate, including Singapore. And my hypothesis is this is actually managing that inflationary expectation. Sent governments want to tell the market or signal to the market, don't worry, we have a tool to manage this. We will try to suppress it if it gets out of hand. So I think that's a very important point. Let me make one last point, though. On the wage side, because I think that is always going to be the major driver uh, in a lot of the sectors in terms of the cost, cost inflation, right? And, and therefore translates into price inflation. There is a different dynamics happening right now on the wage side. I think an average worker is probably losing bargaining power on the wage side. Why? It's because of automation and robotics. I heard this, I can give you many, many examples, but one example that I recently had is, in New York City, there's this restaurant who's trying to find workers, and they cannot find workers, because right now there's a shortage of supply. A lot of people don't want to work. They don't want to risk their life, right, or getting exposed to COVID. Guess what the restaurant owner did? Ordered two robots. And these two robots will create a permanent displacement of, of people, of two jobs in that restaurant, right? And therefore, uh, and again, guess what? They don't have to pay benefits to the robots. Robots can work 24 by 7. There's no unionization of robots. So it does sort of diminish the ability for an average worker to bargain for a high wage. But there's just so many different pieces in this whole thing. I, am, I used to be very firm that this is transitory. <laughs> right now, I'm a little bit hesitant to say that is the case. If I may add, is uh, you put yourself as a consumer, it's not just the wage now today, it's also the medical insurance, right? So the pandemic has a wake-up call for many, they are underinsured. Even for the very rich people, right? Uh, so what, you have uh, money, you can't even get a space in the ICU bed. Right? So people buy advanced insurance now, right, for themselves, for their family. So this well, may not be necessarily rich, right? So, but it does add into the cost of the consumer. So by f just focusing on which, it also doesn't solve the real issue. The elephant in the room is the medical insurance as well, for many now, especially in rich countries. So this too is going to drive behavior. Thank, Thank you. you. I also want to ask the same question to Jack. Is this an inflation trend or inflation expectation trend going to uh, affect your business decision, your asset allocation, for example? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and I think you know, if you really look at the word, coming back to the word inflations, right? Whether or not, are we better off with deflation? That's, 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 that's the next question. But I think, you know, during this pandemic, one thing that's quite apparent is that, you know, we have been entering into a uh, uh, um, new policy era, right? Where the government is actually really proactively managing the economies, right? Uh, you know, from, from capital flow all the way to um, you know the way you do business, and which sector needs to be to be to be monitored. Monopolistic uh, uh, pricing is always an issue. So the quest question is more about who can turn out to be a winner. So from the you know our business is all about backing the winner to be a bigger winner, right? Um, and and that that is one question. The second question is also about you know how do we change the company to have a better chance to be a winner. But if you really look at all the, uh, the, 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 the policy here, it's all about reflations, about output, increasing output, 
right? You know, Lehigh mentions about, you know, the, 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 the crisis here is a result of supply, not the demand. I mean, if you, if you compare this with the, uh, the global financial crisis or the other crisis, the Lehman crisis, it's all on the demand side. This is on the supply side. Uh, and hence, you know, picking the right companies that has uh, pricing power, say for instance, is very important for us. Uh, or on the, those companies that we've already invested in, the questions about how managing your costs and be more efficient, talking about different way of doing things, uh, managing your, your, your distribution networks, say for instance, to make sure that you'll be more relevant. Going in down further to the downstream, say for instance, right? You know, branded, value add. And this is something that we think, again, not try to do some marketing works here, but, you know, we are active investors, right? Um, we try to do it, you know, provide total solution for our portfolio companies, right? We have, you know, a bunch of professionals and, and, and senior advisory board that advise people in terms of strategically what they need to do, not only from the capital side, but also operationally, right? So I think, you know, this environment will create, or, you know, some use it, you know, separate the, uh, since we're talking about diversity and insurance, so separate the ladies from the woman and the, uh, the boys from, or the, the men from the boys, right? So the question is how to, you know, provide better tools for the company to, to do better in the environment going forward. So when we're talking about in the, the mega trends in the region, uh, there's another uh, phenomenon that nobody can ignore, which is the demographic change. Um, there are different trends in the Asian population. And on the one hand, the population of Asian seniors defined as individuals of 60 years and, and over is expected to grow by around 40% over the next decade. On the other hand, the so-called digital natives born between 1980 and uh, uh, 2012, and including members of um, Generation Z and uh, millennials, already account for about one third of the Asian consumption. Now how should uh, consumer-facing companies learn, track, and serve those uh, digital natives and take this huge business opportunity? And how should the investors turn the head of the aging population into a, a tailwind for their own business? So let me start this question from Mr. Linghai. Okay, so first of all, this phenomenon is probably not uniform in Asia, right? In the developing world, actually less so. But if you look at Japan, Taiwan, or even China today, that is an issue. I'm not going to comment on the impact of this on the sort of macro eco economy policy level. Let me talk about, you're, you're asking about the business opportunity, so I'm going to comment at a micro business level. So this is a classic question of one size doesn't fit all, right? For me, it actually speaks to the importance of taking a very segmented view, right? Not treating everybody the same, and then customize your offerings. I would argue, so for instance, we talk about digitization in payments, but I keep reminding my colleagues, in, our, in the payment world, not, not everything is going to be digital. The, the real buzzword, the real name of the game is actually omni-channel. That is, a mix of both physical experiences and online experiences will continue to exist post the pandemic. And we, in terms of our offerings, need to take that into consideration and not assume everybody will just go online. For instance, when Singapore relaxes, I, I would like to meet people for meals and coffee in a real restaurant, physical place, right? I don't want to do this Zoom coffee anymore. <laughs> so so, so, so the, the, the omni-channel thing is, is a very important thing. I talk about how I have never gone into a banking branch anymore. I don't do any banking uh, in, a, in a physical branch. I do everything online in, in, on my mobile. But for, for my mother, that's a very intimidating experience, i.e. online mobile banking. For her, the real safety, real peace of mind is when she walks into a branch and sees a person, right, hands her money over, over the counter. And we need to, so this is the sort of the aging population. We need to continue to accommodate that. So, I think any business think the, the future is digital only, I think that's wrong. It's probably digital first, but I think both physical, a mix of physical digital experiences, really getting the omni-channel strategy right is the key to turning all those into real opportunities and, and tailwinds. Do you have any comments on that about Jekka? No, I think, you know, talking about the aging populations, I think age is one thing, right? The other thing is actually, you know, the uh, the the the, uh, the spending power is increasing as well in overall, right? So yes, you're talking about young and growing populations, but we're also talking about 
you know, purchasing power, which is a swelling middle class, as well as uh, urbanizations, right? You know, for comparison alone, I mean, I try to remember the number, but Indonesia have like 260 million people, right? We're talking about, yes, peop in comparison to Europe, we're talking about, you know, 60% still live, or less than 60%, I think, still live in, on, only live in, in, in urban area, right? The rest is still outside urban area, and that growth is actually going to grow in comparison to Europe, that 80% is already living in urban area, right? So, you know, not only on the age side, but where people live and the consumption pattern is also very important. Exactly what you mentioned as well, Ling Hai, that you know, the, the better way of doing this or digitizations, hopefully will increase the demand, uh, increase the demand for higher quality uh, services and the infrastructures. I mean, the, you know, regardless how you say it, Asia is still behind in terms of infrastructures, right, in, in, in many countries. And, and this is something that we, we think we could do more. And, and tech along, right? You know, digitization is one thing, but physical infrastructures are actually still lagging. Great, thank you so much. And I think the time is really nice. We may have uh, uh, time for one question from the audience, right? Uh, so any, okay, please, please, Mr. Futier. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Fu Jie. I'm the Cai Xing, uh, I'm from Cai Xing Data Technology. So I, when I prepare for the uh, today's agenda, and I have a special interest in your panel because you are talking discussing the mega trend in this region. And uh, today, this morning, there have been a uh, uh, quite some focus on the regional business integration, or we call it economic in integration. For example, uh, DPM Han has mentioned that Singapore is actually actually welcome China's uh, application into the CPTPP. So I was wondering that even before this COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a trend of the regional integration. And now as we are recovering from this, uh, this pandemic, what do you see in the coming years? What's, what will be the difference in the landscape? of a regional economic integration. Will be anything be different from the pre-pandemic pre, pre, uh, uh, eras? Uh, that's one question. And the second question is, as three of you have already mentioned, that oh, there's a lot of disruptions uh, 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 in the supply chains uh, the, uh, during the pandemic. For example, the, the, the coal shortage, the power shortage in China, the supply chain disruption in the US, and uh, the inflation, uh, the CPI inflation in the US and uh, the PPI inflation in China, which are all very high or the highest in the 20, 30 years time. So I, I, I think as a very experienced business leaders in this region, what would you think or what would you forecast could be a next weak spot in the supply chain or in the general business environment? What could be the next risk point? Yeah, interesting maybe, question. Maybe I try. Yeah, it's a it's a very good question. Uh, for for us, uh, for Trafigura, I can only speak about our own experiences. This is our third year in a row for record profit, right? Uh, it's not that we know that the pandemic is going to happen, but at least uh, two and a half years down the uh, earlier, there was uh, the U.S. and China trade war. It's very clear to us uh, back then, three years ago, that it will be intra Asia. Right, it will be intra-Asia going forward. It's very clear. Uh, for us, it does affect us. Right? Before this, we were the largest independent uh, gas trader to bring gas from US to China. So it forced us to think very early on, near shoring, right? maybe from Qatar to China, from Australia to China on the gas supply. Right? So we re rigid our plan and bring it down. So, but when the pandemic came, it accelerated that trend. Right? So we were well positioned. Right, to maximize uh, efficiency and cutting down costs and operationability. Right, so there was, again, a signal why right, if uh, uh, earlier, why right, uh, the pandemic is just accelerating that signal for intra-Asia. So this is one. With or without Japan or with or without the other country, Asia, there's only one word. It's all about trade. Asia is one word, trade, business. Right? We can talk about ideology uh, in the Western Europe and US, but what matters is trade. T-R-A-D-E in this region. So if we do this well, if we uh, uh, partners, the banks and the uh, 
the investors, including digital currency, well, I think this is our century. Uh, we will prolong that trend, that mega trend, right? Uh, if you are not noticing, uh, increasingly people still don't talk about Europe anymore, right? Uh, in a global conversation. I'm not saying that Europe is irrelevant, right? But this will happen to many of us if we're not careful. Right? You talk about history, but the more you talk about history, it means that you have nothing to talk about the future. Right? So at least today, we can talk about the future in a very frank and, and uh, partnership level. I think that, that, that trend will continue. It's intra-Asia, and this is the Asia century. Thank you. Well, the, on, the only thing that I would add on that, I, I agree with that. I think the only thing I would add for that is that I think you know what pandemic has pointed to people is you better clean up your house before you start looking at other people's house. That's, that's for sure, right? If you really look at it, you know, again, from, from the investment perspective alone, right? You, when, when the border is closed, you need to rely on the domestic ec economy, right? So when, from, from the investor's perspective, when we start looking at the opportunity, we want to make sure that the company has a strong hold locally. And I, think, and I think, say for instance, I think the mindset of people investing, you know, when I started my career 25, 30 years ago, and today is very different. In the past 20 years ago, when I was still a banker, I always tried to sell an Indonesian company being, you know what, they export their, uh, their products, US dollar revenue, with IDR costs. Nowadays, if you look at that, com that kind of setup, we would worry. We would worry, because there's a mismatch and relying on outside demand, right? Very different when we're looking at it from a company that is national champions and expanding overseas. But one thing that I agree with you as well is that I think, you know, again, even before pandemic, right, you know, with the trade war and everything else, if you really look at it, you know, investments into China, investment into the US from, 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 from selected companies, they're not significantly coming down either. The relationship, the, the, the need per se are still there, right? And I think, I think pandemic is just slowing down that. I think people will realize that globalization is probably going to be, you know, key theme again going forward if it's, if it's not already. And people start relying that, you know, the world is actually getting smaller, right? Without you realizing. Thank you. So I, I probably add two things. One is um, I, my, my view is you're gonna see a stronger regional integration and that's also my hope. But there is one thing to watch out for. Everywhere I look in Asia, increasing nationalistic sentiment. Whenever we face a crisis, this becomes an easy narrative. And we cannot think of Singapore as a typical country. Singapore is not a typical country. We all understand, and governments all understand trade is important. But when you have a crisis like this, when people are losing their jobs, it's very easy to point to the foreigners that's taking away the jobs, trade that's taking away the jobs, right? And look at the US <laughs> in, in, Trump, in the Trump era. Look at Brexit, right? That's what happened. I, I think this kind of risk completely exists in, in Asia as well. So that's something to watch out for. In terms of supply chain, I would add the vulnerabilities around cybersecurity, actually. Right? Those cyber attacks, cybersecurity, that's one thing. The other thing is, are we truly applying technology in terms of, let's say, distributed finance, digitization, to help with SME finance? Trade finance, big companies actually don't really, oftentimes, they need it. But the small businesses need, need it even more. So that's why the, when the Singapore government is embarking on this uh, effort to increase, encourage trade for small business and cr create more opportunity for trade finance, I think it's spot on, it's the right thing to do. The, the question becomes, is this really lip service? Do the industries really come together? Because the big lenders don't want to lend to the smaller guys, right? They're not profitable, they're too risky. So how do we change that dynamics? I think is another very important thing in the supply chain. Great, great. So thank you so much. Now, I think the time is short. We have to wrap up this great panel. Um, please join me to give a very strong pause of um, uh, applause to our great panel.